The Treasure in the Forest by H. G. Wells The canoe was now approaching land. The bay opened out, and a gap in the white surf of the reef marked where the little river ran out to the sea. The thicker and deeper green of the virgin forest showed its course down by the distant hill slope. The forest here came close to the beach. Far beyond, dim and almost cloud-like in texture, rose the mountains, like suddenly frozen waves. The sea was still, save for an almost imperceptible swell. The sky blazed. The man with the carved paddle stopped. It should be somewhere here, he said. He shipped the paddle and held his arms out straight before him. The other man had been in the forepart of the canoe, closely scrutinizing the land. He had a sheet of yellow paper on his knee. Come and look at this, Evans, he said. Both men spoke in low tones, and their lips were hard and dry. The man called Evans came swaying along the canoe until he could look over his companion's shoulder. The paper had the appearance of a rough map. By much folding, it was creased and worn to the pitch of separation, and the second man held the discolored fragments together where they had parted. On it, one could dimly make out, in almost obliterated pencil, the outline of a bay. Here, said Evans, is the reef, and here is the gap. He ran his thumbnail over the chart. This curved and twisting line is the river. Oh, I could do with a drink now. And this star is the place. You see this dotted line, said the man with the map. It is a straight line and runs from the opening of the reef to a clump of palm trees. The star comes just where it cuts the river. We must mark the place as we go into the lagoon. It's queer, said Evans after a pause, what these little marks down here are for. It looks like the plan of a house or something. But what all these little dashes pointing this way and that may mean, I can't get a notion. And what's the writing? Chinese, said the man with the map. Of course, he was Chinese, said Evan. They all were, said the man with the map. They both sat for some minutes staring at the land while the canoe drifted slowly, and then Evans looked towards the paddle. Your turn with the paddle now, Hooker, said he. And his companion quietly folded up his map, put it in his pocket, passed Evans carefully, and began to paddle. His movements were languid, like those of a man whose strength was nearly exhausted. Evans sat with his eyes half closed, watching the frothy breakwater of the coral creep nearer and nearer. The sky was like a furnace, for the sun was near the zenith. Though they were so near the treasure, he did not feel the exultation he had anticipated. The intense excitement of the struggle for the plan and the long night voyage from the mainland in the unprovisioned canoe had, to use his own expression, taken it out of him. He tried to arouse himself by directing his mind to the ingots the Chinamen had spoken of, but it would not rest there. It came back headlong to the thought of sweet water rippling in the river and to the almost unendurable dryness of his lips and throat. The rhythmic wash of the sea upon the reef was becoming audible now, and it had a pleasant sound in his ears. The water washed along the side of the canoe, and the paddle dripped between each stroke. Presently he began to doze. He was still dimly conscious of the island, but a queer dream texture interwove with his sensations. Once again, it was the night when he and Hooker had hit upon the Chinaman's secret. He saw the moonlit trees, the little fire burning, and the black figures of three Chinamen, silvered by one side on moonlight, and the other glowing from the firelight, and heard them talking together in pidgin English, for they came from different provinces. Hooker had caught the drift of their talk first, and had motioned to him to listen. Fragments of the conversation were inaudible, and fragments incomprehensible. A Spanish galleon from the Philippines hopelessly aground and its treasure buried against the day of return lay in the background of the story. A shipwrecked crew thinned by disease, a quarrel or so, and the needs of discipline, and at last taken to their boats, never to be heard of again. Then Chang Hai, only a year since, wandering ashore, had happened upon the ingots hidden for two hundred years, had deserted his junk, and reburied them with infinite toil, single-handed, but very safe. He laid great stress on the safety. It was a secret of his. Now he wanted help to return and exhume them. 
Presently, the little map fluttered, and the voices sank. A fine story for two stranded British wastrels to hear. Evans's dream shifted to the moments when he had Shanghai's pigtail in his hand. The life of the Chinaman is scarcely sacred like a European's. The cunning little face of Shanghai, first keen and furious like a startled snake, and then fearful, treacherous, and pitiful, became overwhelmingly prominent in the dream. At the end, Shanghai had grinned, an almost incomprehensible and startling grin. Abruptly, things became very unpleasant, as they will do at times in dreams. Shanghai gibbered and threatened him. He saw in his dream heaps and heaps of gold, and Shanghai intervening and struggling to hold him back from it. He took Shanghai by the pigtail, how big the brute was, and how he struggled and grinned. But he kept growing bigger, too. And the bright heaps of gold turned to a roaring furnace, and a vast devil surprising like Shanghai, but with a huge black tail, began to feed him with coals. They burnt his mouth horribly. Another devil was shouting his name. Evans. Evans, you sleepy fool. Or was it Hooker? He woke up. They were in the mouth of the lagoon. There are the three palm trees. It must be in a line with that clump of bushes, said his companion. Mark that. If we go to those bushes, then strike into the bush in a straight line from here, we shall come to it when we come to the stream. They could see now where the mouth of the stream opened out. At the sight of it, Evans revived. Hurry up, man, he said, or by heaven I shall have to drink seawater. He gnawed his hand and stared at the gleam of silver among the rocks and green tangle. Presently, he turned almost fiercely upon Hooker. Give me the paddle, he said. So they reached the river mouth. A little way up, Hooker took some water in the hollow of his hand, tasted it, and spat it out. A little further, he tried again. This will do, he said, and they began drinking eagerly. Oh, curse this, said Evans suddenly. It's too slow. And, leaning dangerously over the forepart of the canoe, he began to suck up the water with his lips. Presently, they made an end of drinking, and running the canoe into a little creek, they were about to land among the thick growth that overhung the water. We shall have to scramble through this to the beach to find our bushes and get the line to the place, said Evans. Well, we'd better paddle round, said Hooker. So they pushed out again into the river and paddled back down to the sea, and along to the shore to the place where the clump of bushes grew. Here they landed, pulled the light canoe far up the beach, and then went up towards the edge of the jungle until they could see the opening of the reef and the bushes in a straight line. Evans had taken a native implement out of the canoe. It was L-shaped, and the transverse piece was armed with polished stone. Hooker carried the paddle. It is straight now in this direction, said he. We must push through this till we strike the stream. Then we must prospect. They pushed through a close tangle of reeds, broad fronds, and young trees. And at first it was toilsome going, but very speedily the trees became larger, and the ground beneath them opened out. The blaze of the sunlight was replaced by insensible degrees by cool shadow. The trees became at last vast pillars that rose up to a canopy of greenery far overhead. Dim white flowers hung from their stems, and ropey creepers swung from tree to tree. The shadow deepened. On the ground, blotched fungi and red-brown incrustation became frequent. Evan shivered. It <clears throat> seems almost cold here after the blaze outside. I hope we're keeping to the strait, said Hooker. Presently they saw, far ahead, a gap in the somber darkness where white shafts of hot sunlight smote into the forest. There also was brilliant green undergrowth and colored flowers. Then they heard the rush of water. Here is the river. We should be close to it now, said Hooker. The vegetation was thick by the river bank. Great plants, as yet unnamed, grew among the roots of the big trees and spread rosettes of huge green fans towards the strip of sky. Many flowers and a creeper with shiny foliage clung to the exposed stems. On the water of the broad, quiet pool, which the treasure sheet seekers now overlooked, there floated big oval leaves and a waxen pinkish-white flower, not unlike a water lily. Further, as the river bent away from them, the water suddenly frothed and became noisy and rapid. Well, said Evans. We have swerved a little from the strait, said Hooker. That was to be expected. He turned and looked into the dim, cool shadows of the silent forest behind them. If we beat a little way up and down the stream, 
We should come to something. But you said, began Evans. He said there was a heap of stones, said Hooker. The two men looked at each other for a moment. Let us try a little downstream first, said Evans. They advanced slowly, looking curiously about them. Suddenly, Evans stopped. What the devil's that, he said. Hooker followed his finger. Something blue, he said. It had come into view as they toppled a gentle swell of the ground. Then he began to distinguish what it was. He advanced suddenly with hasty steps until the body that belonged to the limp hand and arm became visible. His grip tightened on the implement he carried. The thing was the figure of a Chinaman lying on his face. The abandon of the pose was unmistakable. The two men drew closer together and stood staring silently at this ominous dead body. It lay in a clear space among the trees. Nearby was a spade after the Chinese pattern, and further off lay a scattered heap of stones close to a freshly dug hole. Well, somebody's been here before, said Hooker, clearing his throat. Then suddenly Evans began to swear and rave and stamp upon the ground. Hooker turned white, but said nothing. He advanced towards the prostrate body, and he saw the neck was puffed and purple, and the hands and ankles swollen. Puh, he said, and suddenly turned away and went towards the excavation. He gave a cry of surprise. He shouted to Evans, who was following him slowly. You fool, it's all right. It's here still. Then he turned again and looked at the dead Chinaman, and then again at the hole. Evans hurried to the hole. Already half exposed by the ill-fated wretch beside them lay a number of dull yellow bars. He bent down in the hole and, clearing off the soil with his bare hands, hastily pulled one of the heavy masses out. As he did so, a little thorn pricked his hand. He pulled the delicate spike out with his fingers and lifted the ingot. Well, only gold or lead could weigh like this, he said exultantly. Hooker was still looking at the dead Chinaman. He was puzzled. He stole a march on his friends, he said at last. He came here alone, and some poisonous snake has killed him. I wonder how he found the place. Evan stood with the ingot in his hands. What did a dead Chinaman signify? We shall have to take this stuff to the mainland piecemeal and bury it there for a while. How shall we get it to the canoe? He took his jacket off and spread it on the ground and flung two or three ingots into it. Presently he found another little thorn had punctured his skin. Well, this is as much as we can carry, said he. Then suddenly with a queer rush of irritation, What are you staring at? Hooker turned to him. I can't stand him, he nodded towards the corpse. It's so like, oh, rubbish, said Evans. All Chinamen are alike. Hooker looked into his face. Well, I'm going to bury that anyhow, before I lend a hand with this stuff. Don't be a fool, Hooker, said Evans. Let that mass of corruption bide. Hooker hesitated, and then his eye went carefully over the brown soil about them. Yeah, but it scares me somehow, he said. Well, the thing is, said Evans, what to do with these ingots? Shall we rebury them over here, or take them across the strait in the canoe? Hooker thought. His puzzled gaze wandered among the tall tree trunks and up into the remote sunlit greenery overhead. He shivered again as his eye rested upon the blue figure of the Chinaman. He stared searchingly among the gray depths between their knees. "'What's come to you, Hooker?' said Evans. "'Have you lost your wits?' "'Well, let's get the gold out of this place anyhow,' said Hooker. He took the ends of the collar of the coat in his hands, and Evans took the opposite corners, and they lifted the mass. "'Which way?' said Evans, to the canoe. "'It's queer,' said Evans, when they had advanced only a few steps. "'But my arms ache still with that paddling.' Curse it, he said, but they ache. I must rest. They let the coat down, and Evanson's face was white, and little drops of sweat stood out upon his forehead. Boy, it's stuffy somehow in this forest. Then, with an abrupt transition to unreasonable anger, What is the good of waiting here all day? Lend a hand, I say. You've done nothing but moon since we saw the dead Chinaman. Hooker was looking steadfastly at his companion's face. He helped raise the coat, bearing the ingots, and they went forward perhaps a hundred yards in silence. Evans began to breathe heavily. "'Can't you speak?' he said. "'What's the matter with you?' said Hooker. Evans stumbled, and then with a sudden curse flung the coat from him. He stood for a moment staring at Hooker and then with a groan clutched at his own throat. 
Don't come near me, he said, and went and leant against the tree. And then in a steadier voice, I'll be better in a minute. Presently his grip upon the trunk loosened, and he slipped slowly down the stem of the tree until he was a crumpled heap at its foot. His hands were clenched convulsively. His face became distorted with pain. Hooker approached him. Don't touch me! Don't touch me! said Evans in a stifled voice. Put the gold back on the coat. Well, can't I do anything for you? said Hooker. Put the gold back on the coat! Well, as Hooker handled the ingots, he felt a little prick on the ball of his thumb. He looked at his hand and saw a slender thorn perhaps two inches in length. Evans gave an inarticulate cry and rolled over. Hooker's jaw dropped. He stared at the thorn for a moment with dilated eyes. Then he looked at Evans, who was now crumpled together on the ground, his back bending and straightening spasmodically. Then he looked through the gray pillars of the trees and the network of creeper stems, where in the dim gray shadow, the blue-clad body of the Chinaman was still indistinctly visible. He thought of the little dashes in the corner of the plan, and in a moment, he understood. God help me, he said, for those thorns were similar to the Dyak's poison they use in their blowing tubes. He understood now what Shanghai's assurance of the safety of his treasure meant. He understood that grin now. Evans, he cried. But Evans was silent and motionless, save for a horrible spasmodic twitching of his limbs. A profound silence brooded over the forest. Then Hooker began to suck furiously at the little pink spot on the ball of his thumb, sucking for dear life. Presently he felt a strange aching pain in his arms and shoulders, and his fingers seemed difficult to bend. And then he knew that sucking was no good. Abruptly he stopped and sitting down by the pile of ingots and resting his chin upon his hands and his elbows upon his knees, he stared at the distorted but still quivering body of his companion. Chang Hai's grin came into his mind again. The dull pain spread towards his throat and grew slowly in intensity. Far above him a faint breeze stirred in the greenery, and the white petals of some unknown flower came floating down through the gloom.